Hello, everybody, and welcome to Real Quick, episode 110. It's just George and I today, and we're going to be reviewing a Patreon suggestion, as always, from Daniel Stegman, and that is Sunshine from Danny Boyle. We just reviewed a Danny Boyle movie a couple weeks ago, actually, in terms of uh, uh, 28 Days Later. Was that also written by Alex Garland, too? So this yeah. Yeah. I completely when I when I selected this for the week, I actually completely forgot that we had done a Danny Boyle Alex Garland film like three weeks early. <laughs> I mean, I'm down for that because 28 Days Later, obviously a great film, and Sunshine yeah. is it's also I very much enjoyed it, but it's definitely a lot more under the radar than 28 Days Later. At least yeah. for me, I'd never heard of Sunshine before. 28 Days Later, I feel like everyone's like heard of that movie before. Um, the cast for this is insane, like just so stacked, so deep. You got Killian Murphy, Michelle Yeoh. Rose Byrne, Benedict Wong, Chris Evans, Mark Strong, uh, Hiroyuki Sanada. There's pretty much everyone that's like notable, but like it's just yeah. everyone in this movie that's in this, you know, spacecraft on this mission is just like everyone who pops up, you're like, oh, they're from this other thing. And obviously, 2007 is before a lot of them, especially like Rose Byrne and Chris Evans, became super massive stars, but and Killian Murphy to an extent, but Killian Murphy is still pretty big at this point. Michelle Yeoh, I think, got a resurgence in her career from at EEAAO, but mm -hmm. she obviously from Couching Tiger, Hidden Dragon had very much a career before this. So another Danny Boyle, Alex Garland connection. The quick synopsis is if the sun dies, so do we 50 years into the future. The sun is dying and earth is threatened by Arctic temperatures. A team of astronauts is sent to revive the sun, but the mission fails. Seven years later, a new team is sent to finish the mission as mankind's last hope. So this is like a sci-fi slash thriller. The third act, honestly, dives into horror a bit. Kind of a genre-bending <laughs> movie by Danny Boyle here. Um, but yeah, I know you've seen this at least twice, maybe more, three times maybe? No, just twice. I had only seen it for the first time. When was my first log of this? June 14. So that was my first ever watch of it, and I just recently rewatched it like 10 days ago, 11 days ago. Mm -hmm. and it was immediately um, a five star for you it was watch. immediately a five star when i was writing my review i actually had like my initial review it was in as a four and a half star and it was just one of those like moments where like as i kept typing out my review i was like damn i like this movie way more than a four and a half star like what mm -hmm. i'm saying just sounds like a five star review so then i revisited it 10 week, 10 days or so ago before I even knew we were going to do this real quick. And I was like, I'm so curious, like if it'll remain a five star for me, because not only was it a five star, but I had moved it up really high on like my all time great list. Mm -hmm. um, so I rewatched it, stayed a five star for me. Um, I'm super curious to hear what you have it rated because your letterbox review is is making me think four and a half or five star, maybe four star. Um, but yeah, this was it was just such a crazy experience. It was such an ambitious experience the first time I watched it. Cause I feel like, like you said, this has, this is kind of like a forgotten science fiction gem. Obviously we've had like the boom of Christopher Nolan and Denis Villeneuve over the last couple of years. And I feel like this one just flies under everyone's radar. Like you said, I hadn't heard of this movie prior to watching it for the first time. It had come across, um, one of my mutuals had watched it. So it came across like my news from friends section on Letterboxd. And I was like, okay, let me toss this on my uh, watch list. And then one day I was like, okay, I'm in the mood for some new science fiction. So I tossed it on and was just immediately fucking blown away. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I gave it a 4.5. Um, it yeah. was close between a 4 and 4.5, but I ended up leaning 4.5. And But honestly, like, I do think this could legitimately be five star, or at least lock in a 4.5 on a rewatch because this is like a dense movie. Like, There's a lot I feel like I didn't fully grasp on first watch. But the one thing that I did grasp is that this movie, like the budget I just looked up is 40 million. It was a bomb because it didn't make, make much, much of the box office, which makes sense because I don't think many people include, like, had heard of it until like maybe recently with some friends watching it. But uh, I think a lot of people listening to this probably won't even have heard of this before. So it, it's crazy the production value on this. Like, the everything from, like, it was like almost like interstellar level visuals and stuff. Like, yeah. With the sun, with the spacecraft, with these explosions like everything going on was crazy and i was like how are they doing this because like i knew from 28 days later and danny boyle in general and just the fact that we hadn't heard much about it that i was like there's no way there's a high budget film just based on just it not being a mainstream title like i feel like if it was a 200 million dollar blockbuster we would have known about it so yeah 40 million dollars makes sense but the visuals were crazy and like the editing paired with it was so good too the 
there's like i mean this isn't a spoiler or anything but there's like quick little jump scares where there's like a quick little fl- not jump scares but like there's like a flashing image or something yeah that would just keep happening it caught me so off guard the first time i literally paused it and rewind i'm like i because the movie right now if you want to watch it if you're listening to this it's on youtube for free you can watch it for youtube for free so i was like at first i was like is this just like a like a YouTube thing, like did an ad just try to play? Like, was it like a glitch? Like, I genuinely didn't know because it was just like a quick flash of a face. I'm like, what the fuck is that shit? I was like, because I was so into the movie, I was like leaned into my computer watching, and I was like, it genuinely took me so off guard. And then I rewinded it. I'm like, okay, I guess this is supposed to be in there. I went, I went to the YouTube comments. And that's another thing. Watching the movie on YouTube is comments. I was like, did anyone say like, oh, at 45 minute or whatever? Like, did you anyone else see that little thing? I was like, I guess it was supposed to happen, but that took me off guard. The whole third act kind of goes into like a more horror route, but it's still a kind of a tense thriller the whole time um pretty similar to most sci-fi plots in terms of you know a group of people are on a mission mission goes wrong gonna have to do something crazy in order to save it i mean that's kind of just the formula for a sci-fi movie so it doesn't really reinvent the wheel there but it just perfectly executes the wheel in terms of everything that they do they do to the to the absolute height of their powers the entire cast is great Uh, i know cam texted in our group chat i didn't care much for the characters i I mean maybe i could kind of see that but i I cared for them Uh, i thought all their performances were super good uh definitely a lot of surprises in this and it's, and it's one that i already want to rewatch like immediately just because there's so much to chew on from this and i was excited to talk to you about it because i knew you loved it so much and uh yeah I had a great time with it. that's that's kind of overall my review and we can kind of dive into talking about the movie itself and any kind of more spoilery stuff or just kind of be able to talk freely about the movie without worrying about any uh kind of holding their tongue a bit or anything but yeah, yeah. We, we can talk i, I want to touch on your point of the 40 million dollar budget that's news to me um i i had never for some reason i had just kind of just accepted that this was like a hundred hundred and twenty million dollar mm-hmm. budget movie just because of that, how ambitious it is the entire sequence um when they're like outside on the panels trying to fix them I, it's just like examples of that is like okay like this has to be just a massive budget movie and then you see how just epic and grand of a scale that this film is 40 million is unbelievable how much alex garland Alex Garland, Jesus, how much Danny Boyle was able to accomplish with that? Um, not tiny, obviously, 40 million is a lot, right. but for that tiny budget, given just how much ambition he needed to, to properly execute this film. So, to execute on a level that he did with that little budget is just unbelievable. But yeah, like you said, I don't think this film necessarily reinvents the wheel. It is very, you know, science fiction expected. Um, I just think this is one of the science fiction films that just kind of dives into a lot more than you would typically expect in science fiction. There's a lot of conflict. There's a lot of internal struggle. There's a lot of questions of morality in this movie, which I really appreciate from Alex Garland as the writer of this film to kind of get into. He could have very easily written, you know, some incredibly surface level science fiction film of just a team of heroes needs to go and save humanity. and, And that's it. Giving us cool visuals. Um, but he took the time to really dissect a lot in this movie. Um, I don't know. Cam, Cam texted that in much kid that he didn't much care for a lot of the characters. I think that's a crazy take. I think this movie does such a good job at, um, you know, it, it's a big cast, not, not a big cast, but there's what we start off with seven, eight people uh, aboard this spacecraft. Mm-hmm. Um, and this film really takes its time with all of them, obviously, um, I think Chris Evans and Killian Murphy's character, um, they just dive into a little bit more because they are the kind of um, opposition that we kind of need, that this internal conflict that we kind of need for this movie. But I think every single character is just is just brilliant. When when Killian Murphy is having his bad dreams and he's talking to to that female and she's like, it's all I ever dream about is the surface of the sun. Like I think that dives into her character incredibly well and kind of what she's going through. And I think there's little moments like that throughout the film with every character that just makes it worthwhile when their eventual fate comes to pass, um, which I really, really like. And then just the score is something I know we can get into spoilers soon. And I'm sorry for rambling, but the no, score, no, no, I love it. I shit you not. The first time I watched this movie, this was the only thing I was listening to for the next four, three, four weeks was the score of this movie. I think it's just, the most awe-inspiring, breathtaking score that kind of couples this epic journey towards the sun just as brilliantly as you could possibly expect. It was so heartfelt and so depressed when it needed to be, but then there were these moments, especially towards the end with Killian Murphy's character, 
um, where it just it is just so bold and it just matches the level of epic that this movie needs it to. Um, so that's another thing I just wanted to point out. Um, but yeah, as a whole, this is just one of those science fiction films that I think does, like you said, it doesn't reinvent the wheel. It just executes everything to perfection in my mind, everything from our characters to the journey to the deeper themes that I mentioned earlier. I just think every part of this film just comes together so beautifully to create just one of the most ambitious and I, I keep using that word and I'm going to keep using that word because I truly think ambitious and audacious are the two best words to describe this film. Um, but yeah, I just think everything comes together just to create such an epic experience in science fiction. And I mean, you know, better than everyone, anyone science fiction is my favorite genre of film. So when you could hit me and affect me this much within science fiction, when I, when I'm putting your name next to the Nolans and the Villeneuve's of the world in science fiction, take this film seriously. That's just how much I fucking love this movie. Sorry yeah. for rambling. No, no, no. That was great. <laughs> Not, that's why I was so excited to talk to you about this one because I know you do love it so much and this is a movie that deserves to be raved about. I think anyone listening to this that hasn't seen it or even heard of it that's a sci-fi fan, you're going to love it. If you're not a sci-fi fan like me, I am not. I wouldn't consider myself the biggest sci-fi fan at all. But when there's stuff like Ridley Scott's Blade Runner or Denis Villeneuve's Dune, like something that's amazing that truly hits everything nail on the head, then I appreciate it and love the hell out of it. And that's the same thing for this. Um, there to me, like maybe it's just Nolan and Oppenheimer and stuff just been on the bl- brain too much lately. But I feel like I, I feel like Nolan has to be a fan of like Danny Boyle or at least this movie for like both Interstellar and Oppenheimer, but especially Interstellar because obviously it's science fiction based. But um, Mark Strong's character in the third act kind of coming in and throwing a wrench into things felt very similar to like Matt Damon yep. and Interstellar throwing in throwing a wrench into things. Um, reading just some stuff about the movie production. The biggest challenge for them making the movie was making the sun look realistic and it was the longest project ever longest cgi sequencing ever done by a london production um, at the time in 2007 so obviously very similar to what we all know about like interstellar how like the whole black hole like was the sequence that they worked on forever had insane budget on that like universities still use today as actual you know video recreations of what a black hole would be like so both of them were heavily invested in trying to make these super space realistic so there's just a lot of parallels here i think between nolan's interstellar and danny boyle's sunshine and i know when we reviewed 28 days later we talked about how his career is so weird like it just jumps around all over the place because this there's a movie called millions that came out in 2004 but that's the only movie that came out between 28 days later and sunshine and then after this he did slumdog millionaire 127 hours Steve Jobs, Yesterday, that Beatles movie, um, which, of course, is very much not science fiction. And that's because yeah. one of the things he was quoted saying was um, he, he's a huge fan of the Blade Runner from Ridley Scott. So he's super excited to do a science fiction movie. But he said after this, he said it was so exhausting making a science fiction project. He vowed he would never make a sci-fi movie again. But he, he's one for one. So I guess quit while you're yeah. mad. I was just looking at his filmography actually while you were saying that. I did not realize that kind of like I mean, obviously we reviewed Twenty Eight Days Later a couple of weeks ago, and that's just incredibly far off of like what Sunshine is as a film. And then I just noted I just realized he was the responsible for 127 hours and yesterday and twenty eight days later. Um and Slumdog Millionaire. I never realized that this was all of him. That's a crazy filmography, but and also to your point of like inspiration, yeah, it Nolan, it looks like from what you said, I, I completely agree. He pulled a lot of inspiration just in terms of like these massive set pieces from Danny Boyle. But then I could also see Danny Boyle. He's looked as if he pulled a lot of inspiration from, like you mentioned, um, Ridley Scott's Blade Runner in more of the thematic elements of this movie, you know, a, a morality conflict, an internal struggle. And then even further back, it looks like he kind of pulled a lot of inspiration from 2001, A Space Odyssey, where there was just this very haunting aura throughout, you know, everything kind of seems like it's going the right way, but then it kind of slowly, slowly unravels while this, you know, very calm demeanored and I don't know, I, f- I feel weird calling Mark Strong's character a villain because I don't necessarily see him as a villain. I kind of see him more of like an anti-hero a little bit because in his eyes, you know, he's also just struggling with this question of morality. And, and I think what he was able to, uh, what, what, what he saw on his journey is, is kind of making him make these decisions. So I, I hate calling him a villain because it just doesn't seem right. But he reminds me a lot of Hal from... 2001 a space odyssey where he's just very 
calm in what he's trying to accomplish. He's just, he's very haunting. His aura, just, just seeing his face, is just makes you very uncomfortable. So, so I like to see this progression of science fiction from, you know, as early as 2001 A Space Odyssey to Blade Runner to Sunshine all the way to the Nolans and the Villeneuves of the world because it kind of seems like they're all just adding on top of each other. They're all just building, you know, Stanley Kubrick set the foundation, Ridley Scott expanded on it. Danny Boyle kind of took a lot of that inspiration and created his own little science fiction project. And then you get to Nolan's Interstellar, um, Villeneuve's Blade Runner 2049. And it seems like they're trying to reinvent the wheel, but they're also trying to pay homage to, to these science fiction greats that came before it. And I like that, you know, when you, even though Sunshine is not as acclaimed or as maybe well known as the films that I've mentioned, um, I, I like that we can kind of acknowledge that it's in that cycle like it's there when we're talking about these great science fiction films just because of the inspiration it both pulled from earlier films and kind of the precedent it set for for upcoming science fiction films um mm -hmm. another thing that i just want to mention was what what or why i wanted to touch on was what you said with the sun and how that was like the biggest feat of cgi within this entire um uh in this entire production i think the whole movie and again i'm going to bring it back to that 40 million dollar budget the whole movie just looks stunning there were so many frames and just shot selections where i genuinely just kept thinking to myself i cannot believe this was 2007 because mm -hmm. um, you look at a lot of like blockbusters from the the 2000s the early middle late 2000s and everyone's criticism right now is kind of like yeah, the movie still holds up. And honestly, I'll even bring Spider-Man 2 into the conversation. I know it's not a science fiction film, but everyone agrees. Mm -hmm. The writing holds up. The movie as a whole holds up. But the CGI does not necessarily hold up. And I think there are so many big blockbusters from that period of time that you can say these exact same words at. And I don't think Sunshine falls into that category. I watched this movie and I'm like, this is just stunning. If it wasn't for the slightly grainy um camera work i would have told you this movie was made in 2018 that that's how just how brilliant i think the whole the movie as a whole looks and feels mm -hmm. definitely like yeah the science fiction is is phenomenal in this and then beyond that he's able to make it like a thriller and horror ish at the same time because it's so haunting in the third act when we hear like, so basically they realize there's only enough oxygen for four of the five survivors. So they're going to go kill Trey. But then when they get there, he already heartbreaking. Suicide. Definitely. Um, so then there's four people left. Okay, cool. There's enough oxygen. And then kind of like the intercom system says, uh, you know, there's five survivors on board. And then Killian Murphy's character is like, no, or Kappa. He's like, no, no, there's four, you know, Trey's dead. And then they're like, no, there's five on here. It's like, no, you're, you're wrong. And they're like, who's the fifth person? Like, where are they? And it's just so haunting when they realize like there's someone else on board here. We have no clue who they are, where they are. And then it just turns into just a truly tense thriller, um, which I think it, it just does such a great job. Similar to 28 Days Later of this movie, we talked about how it gra grapples with morality, but also mortality because, A, the whole reason they're up there in the first place is to s revive the sun and save the sun so humanity will be saved. But even when they're up there, Trey kills himself for the betterment of society. And then from there, slowly, one by one, they all start dying off and dying off until finally at the very end, obviously. Is that how, sorry to interrupt, is yeah, that how ahead. you see Trey's death? He he killed himself because he wanted to protect his his comrades, I guess? I'm not saying like, I, I don't know if that was his motive, but I'm saying like in terms of just like reading from a screenplay perspective. Yeah. Like, yeah, I always I saw know. I always saw his suicide as more of like a he feels responsible for having put his team in this situation in the first place because he had done those initial calculations incorrectly that had right. yeah that that's how I had always saw his death which that that to me just obviously just one of the more heartbreaking moments in mm -hmm. in the in the movie right there with um oh god what's his name that I'm missing out the the captain that sacrificed himself on the panels um Kanata. Uh -huh um yeah, yeah yeah that was one of the more another heartbreaking and like mm -hmm. hearing like killian murphy's voice on the intercom like what are you doing why is he not moving like it's just and again that score composition in the background is just so mm -hmm. just mesmerizing it's so beautiful but it's so fucking depressed and just unnerving it's so oh, god the movie is so good this movie's good watch <laughs> this movie if you have not watched this movie <laughs> yeah for real um 
and yeah, like, cause yeah, like you said, I think, I think guilt is the reason he commits suicide, but I think also like from reading it from a just overall film perspective of what they're trying to do, like saving the world from a dying son, uh, you know, you can kind of read it as like, you know, they're the guilty conscience of humans in, in general being the reason the world has kind of run its course and is going to be, you know, taken over because we've just mistreated our whole universe so badly that now it's going to be the very thing that consumes us and kills us. Um, so that's also another way you can kind of read his suicide of just like the guilt of, you know, trying to be the one who saves it, but failing. And then that ends up being what's ultimately going to kill them all. Um, but ultimately, I mean, it ends on like a happy ish note. Like it's the very end of the movie shows like, you know, they're there, I guess. Yep. <laughs> like on, on earth, like they're still alive. Yeah. Yeah. They, again, they did their job, but right. it, it's like, but at what cost? And I think the movie made it very clear that this group of, of, whatever you want to call them, heroes, scientists, uh, whatever you want to call them, physicists, mm-hmm. um, they understand throughout, understood throughout their mission that their lives are inconsequential to what they're trying to accomplish. That's why Chris Evans' character, I think, I, as much as he comes off as like the arrogant douchebag of the crew, he's the one mm-hmm. that had like the mission on his mind. I think that's just a big mm-hmm. overall theme of this movie where they kind of had to accept that yeah, their lives are expendable here. They, you know, they die, they die. Their final goal is the mission, regardless of what sacrifice you had to make. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's just one area of this film that I just excels in like crazy is, is having our main characters kind of understanding their purpose, but also initially some of them are rejecting their purpose and it kind of plays out to a point where by the end of it, they're all kind of like, okay, we have a reason for being here. If we fail, our whole planet dies, everyone dies. So they, again, that's where you kind of bring in Trey's suicide. He kind of feels like not only did he let down his crew, but he could have potentially let down, you know, all of mankind. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just, like I said, I think that's just a very strong point of this movie where everyone's kind of character progression into slowly accepting their fate or accepting their potential fate um, just play such a benefit to this movie and to this story. And that's, again, where I think Alex Garland just does such an exceptional job as the screenplay writer here, um, where he kind of just makes everyone, including the audience, question what's right, what's wrong, what's ne- what needs to be done versus, you know, maybe what should be done. Um, it's just, it's great writing in science fiction in my mind. And it's just one of the most compelling screenplays in science fiction that I've seen. Definitely. Yeah, I mean... Definitely watch this movie if you haven't seen it. One kind of fun fact is that um, Danny Boyle was so impressed with Michelle Yeoh's audition that he told her she could have any part in the script. He would give her any part. If she wanted one of the male parts, he would regender the character <laughs> to be a female. So Michelle Yeoh, I mean, we already knew she was, you know, a yeah. queen and a goddess, but that just shows that he, she's always been always been that way, all the way back in, you know, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, all yeah. the way currently with EEAAO and kind of in the middle with this. Um, she's just always been cooking. Um but yeah. Where would I, I have a question for you? And I don't yeah. I don't know how much of like Killian Murphy's filmography you've watched, but like mm-hmm. where would you rank this in terms of his performances? Because I think this is one of his like more just emotionally profound performances where I just think he hits such a range of emotion and his character. He as an actor does such a good job at just reacting to everything as a human being would and like you like that final scene in Oppenheimer he does such a good job in this movie at acting with just like his eye expressions and I think it's just brilliant in this movie yeah I mean I'm looking at on Letterbox. I guess I only have six of his movies logged and what well I guess only Batman Begins is showing up but he's another two Batman so I guess eight total movies logged of his um Dunkirk, I, I think this surpasses Dunkirk, but he wasn't really given much to do in Dunkirk. Yeah. Um, I think this passes Inception for acting performances for me. Yep. Uh, Oppenheimer, I, I think, is his magnum opus, but I don't think anyone would disagree with that. And then 28 I Days agree. Later, I think he's about on the same level. I think he's matured since 28 Days Later in this. I, I don't know. I think this could be up there as like number two. I think it's definitely yeah. a, his one of his best performances he ever done. Yeah, I think it's high. And I truly think if this film was like, more well received or more well you know known he would have Mm -hmm. become a more mainstream actor way earlier than peaky blinders right yeah that's really what kind of put him on the mainstream map but yeah giving out crazy performances way before that yeah he's been a goat for a while he knows what he's doing anything else you want to say 
Uh, no, honestly, I think I, we, we kind of touched on everything I wanted to bring up. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think of anything like last minute that I want to, um, yeah, no, I think we touched on everything really. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I give it a 4.5. Uh, you give it a five star twice. So it's been verified, confirmed yeah. as a five star. <laughs> um, what did Cam give it a four or uh, 72, 71, out of 100, 71. So out of three and a half. Yeah. Dude's <laughs> dude's cracked. He's, yeah. He doesn't know what he's talking about. If yeah. you haven't if you haven't heard of this movie, haven't seen this movie, go watch it. Uh, Daniel Stegman, shout out to you for the recommendation. We hope you enjoyed this review of Sunshine by Danny Boyle, written by Alex Garland. With that, we will see you Monday with Real Talk episode 62. Peace out.